In Deuteronomy 20 verses 16 to 18, Yahweh commands, In the cities of the nations the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them. That's not just a strategy for survival, that's divine genocide. Monotheism didn't happen overnight, it was a process, a political and theological evolution where Yahweh was gradually elevated above all others. And as we've seen throughout history, the stories of the victors tend to become the official narrative. Let me take you back to a time when the Bible wasn't the clean-cut, polished monotheistic text we know today. Ancient Israel wasn't always the land of one God, one faith. In fact, dig into the archaeological record, and you'll find a goddess standing right next to Yahweh himself. Yes, you heard that right, Yahweh had a wife. Her name was Asherah. Now, the mainstream religious narrative would have you believe that Yahweh was always this solo, supreme being, ever alone, ever dominant. But here's the thing, the early Israelites weren't always strictly monotheistic. They had a pantheon of deities, and Asherah was one of the big players. This wasn't some fringe belief, it was mainstream, right there in the heart of Israelite worship. Evidence of this comes from inscriptions found in Kerbet Elkom and Kantilit Adrud, two archaeological sites where ancient Hebrew inscriptions refer to Yahweh and his Asherah. This isn't just wild speculation. We're talking about physical proof, ancient texts etched into stone and pottery, showing that Yahweh wasn't the lone divine figure in the earliest days of Israel. Inscriptions found at Kantilit Adrud speak directly of Yahweh and his Asherah. This wasn't heresy or blasphemy, this was the reality of worship in the 9th century BCE. The people of ancient Israel clearly revered a divine pair, not just Yahweh by himself. Why has this been buried for so long? Simple. As the political landscape changed and as Israel moved towards monotheism, particularly during the religious reforms of King Josiah, the idea of God having a wife was seen as problematic. Yahweh had to be reshaped into the ultimate, solitary deity. So, Asherah was slowly written out of the narrative, erased from the official story. Temples dedicated to her were torn down, and the priesthood worked overtime to cleanse the scriptures of her presence. Monotheism wasn't just a theological shift, it was a political one. You see, Asherah wasn't some minor deity. In Canaanite mythology, she was known as the Queen of Heaven, the Goddess of Fertility, Motherhood, and life. In fact, Asherah was worshipped for centuries across the ancient Near East, long before Yahweh even appeared on the scene. She was the wife of El, the high god of the Canaanite pantheon. And here's the kicker, early Israelite religion borrowed a lot from these Canaanite traditions. Yahweh likely started as a regional deity, and as his cult grew, he absorbed many of the roles and attributes of El. But Asherah? She stayed right beside him, the Bible itself even hints at Asherah's presence. Take a look at the Book of Kings, where it mentions sacred poles or ashram being set up in the Temple of Yahweh. These poles were symbols of Asherah's presence. The Bible doesn't shy away from this, it outright admits that the Israelites were worshipping both Yahweh and Asherah, until later reforms erased her from the picture. The Temple in Jerusalem, yes, the holiest site in Judaism once had symbols of Asherah within its sacred walls. But it didn't stop with the sacred poles. Asherah symbols were everywhere, in household shrines, carved into amulets, even painted on walls. Families prayed to her for fertility and protection, right alongside Yahweh. This was a deeply ingrained belief system, not some minor cult. The fact that she was so widespread made it even more dangerous for those pushing monotheism, they had to wipe out her worship entirely if they wanted Yahweh to stand alone. So why haven't you heard about Asherah? Well, because history is written by the victors. The push for monotheism was so successful that Asherah was all but erased from the official record. The early scribes and priests who compiled the Old Testament had a clear agenda, Yahweh had to be the one and only God, with no divine competition. Any trace of Asherah had to go. But archaeology doesn't lie, and the traces of Asherah's worship are too widespread and too consistent to ignore. Now, think about the implications. The idea of God having a wife shakes the foundations of everything we've been taught about monotheism.
it forces us to reimagine the entire narrative. Yahweh wasn't always the lone god of the Bible. In fact, early on, he had a partner, a divine counterpart who stood as his equal. And yet, through centuries of religious and political maneuvering, she was wiped from history. But thanks to archaeology, ancient texts, and scholars willing to dig deeper, Asherah's story is coming back to light. Yahweh wasn't always the top god on the block. In fact, ancient myths suggest that Yahweh himself might have had a father. Yeah, you heard that right. I'm talking about El, the supreme god of the Canaanite pantheon, and the idea that Yahweh was originally just one of many divine sons in a larger cosmic family. In the ancient world, the land we now call Israel was a crossroads of culture and religion. The Canaanites, who were the dominant culture in the region, had their own pantheon of gods, and at the top of that hierarchy was El, that father of gods. El was the creator, the high god, the one who ruled over all. And here's where it gets interesting, in some ancient texts, Yahweh is portrayed as one of El's sons. Let that sink in for a second. This isn't just speculation. We've got ancient texts, including Ugaritic writings, that lay it out. The Ugaritic texts, which come from a city-state on the coast of modern-day Syria, describe a pantheon where El presides over a council of gods, and one of his divine children was, wait for it, Yahweh. That's right. Yahweh wasn't always the all-powerful, standalone deity we think of today. He was part of a family, a divine family, where El, the father, was the true supreme being. In these early mythological traditions, El wasn't just a figurehead. He was the real deal, the creator god who ruled with wisdom and authority. And Yahweh? He was one of the lesser gods, a kind of regional deity. This makes sense when you realize that Yahweh started out as a war god worshipped by certain nomadic tribes. He wasn't originally the all-encompassing god of everything, he had to climb the ladder, so to speak. Now, you're probably wondering, how did Yahweh go from being a son of El to the god we know today? Here's where things get really fascinating, and political. As the Israelites consolidated their power, they needed a singular, powerful figure to unite the people, and Yahweh was a perfect fit. But to make him the top god, they had to rewrite history. Over time, Yahweh was promoted from one of El's sons to the only god, the one true deity. El's role was gradually erased or merged with Yahweh's identity. But wait, there's more. If you read the Old Testament carefully, you'll find some intriguing hints that the authors couldn't completely scrub away. There are passages where Yahweh seems to be part of a larger divine council. For instance, in Deuteronomy 32 verses 8 to 9, it says, When the Most High divided the nations, the Lord's portion was his people, Jacob his allotted inheritance. Who's this Most High? In ancient context, that's El, the original head honcho. Yahweh's role here seems to be a delegated one, his ruling over Israel as part of El's divine plan. Another bombshell, in Psalm 82, Yahweh presides over a council of gods. That's right, gods, plural. The passage describes Yahweh standing among other deities and even judging them. Again, this points back to the idea of Yahweh once being part of a broader pantheon where El or some other higher god ruled supreme. Over time, Yahweh consolidated his power, kicking the other gods out of the picture, but these textual echoes of his former status remain. So why did El get sidelined? Why did Yahweh end up as the one true god? Well, it all comes down to control. The political and religious leaders of ancient Israel knew they needed a single, all-powerful God to unify the nation, especially during times of crisis, like the Babylonian exile. Yahweh became the centerpiece of their national identity. They couldn't have him sharing the stage with El or any other gods. The old myths had to go, and a new narrative had to be written, one where Yahweh was always the supreme being from the start. Let's get right to it, the book of Genesis has two creation stories, not one. That's right, two. If you've never noticed this, don't worry, because most people gloss over it, assuming the Bible is one seamless narrative. But here's the thing, it's not. These two stories are different in tone, structure, and even the way creation unfolds. 
And here's the kicker, some scholars argue these differences point to multiple gods at play. Now, let's break this down. In Genesis 1, we get the famous, orderly creation story where God creates everything in six days. It's all very structured, very methodical. Day 1, light, day 2, sky, day 3, land and plants, and so on. But pay attention here, the Hebrew word used for God in this story is Elohim, which is actually plural. Yep, plural. So, who's we in this context? Why is a plural name used for God in a text that's supposed to promote monotheism? Fast forward to Genesis 2, and it's a completely different vibe. This is where you get the more intimate, almost earthy account of creation. Instead of God speaking things into existence from above, he's down in the dirt, forming Adam from clay, breathing life directly into him. The word for God here? Yahweh Elohim, which is a shift. Now we're talking about a specific, singular figure. So, what's going on here? Are we looking at two different gods, or maybe two different traditions merged into one text? The first creation account, where Elohim creates the world, might come from an older priestly tradition that had a more cosmic, distant view of God, or gods. The use of Elohim in the plural suggests that this version of the story could be reflecting an earlier, polytheistic worldview, one where a council of gods, or at least multiple divine figures, were involved in creation. This isn't just a wild guess, similar ideas show up in other ancient Near Eastern texts, like the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation epic, where multiple gods collaborate to shape the universe. Now let's switch gears and look at Genesis 2, where Yahweh Elohim takes center stage. This second account is more personal and, frankly, more chaotic. Yahweh doesn't follow a perfect sequence like Elohim does in Genesis 1. Instead, it feels like he's improvising, he creates Adam first, then realizes Adam needs a companion, so Eve comes later. It's a different style, a different narrative, almost like the work of a different god. There's strong evidence that these two stories were written by different groups at different times. The Elohim account comes from a later period when Israelite religion was becoming more monotheistic, influenced by priests who wanted a more refined, authoritative god. But the Yahweh story? That's likely an older, more tribal myth, where Yahweh is hands-on, forming man from dust, crafting the first humans like a potter. It's raw, it's earthy, and it reflects a time when Yahweh was still a regional god, connected directly to the land and the people. Scholars believe these two stories were merged, stitched together when the Hebrew Bible was being compiled, probably around the time of the Babylonian exile. By then, the priests were working hard to smooth over any traces of polytheism and create a seamless monotheistic story. But they couldn't just throw out the old stories, they were too culturally significant. So, what did they do? They combined them. What you end up with is a Bible that starts with a polytheistic hint, the plural Elohim creating the world, and then shifts to the monotheistic Yahweh, giving us the narrative we're more familiar with today. In Genesis 1 verse 26, God says, Let us make man in our image, after OU likeness. Hold up, who's this thus? If Yahweh is supposed to be alone, why does he need to consult anyone? Traditional interpretations have tried to say this is a royal we, or maybe the trinity. But those are later theological constructs. In the context of the ancient Near East, the far more logical explanation is that this reflects a memory of an earlier polytheistic framework, where multiple gods work together in the act of creation. We see similar language in the ancient Ugaritic texts, where El, the chief god of the pantheon, would confer with a council of divine beings. Sound familiar? It should, because the Bible is drawing from these same ancient traditions. It's not just borrowing imagery, it's pulling from the deep well of shared mythological concepts that dominated the ancient world. Well, it suggests that early Israelite religion wasn't as strictly monotheistic as we've been led to believe. The traces of polytheism are right there in the text, hidden in plain sight. The Bible's creation stories are not a unified account of one supreme God creating everything in a tidy, orderly fashion. Instead, they're a mashup of two different stories, two different gods, possibly, that reflect the evolution of Israelite belief from polytheism to monotheism. Here's a question no one seems to ask, before Yahweh, 
Who was God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? You might think it was always Yahweh, right? Not so fast. The Bible itself tells a different story. In the early chapters, God isn't always referred to as Yahweh, he's called El Shaddai. In Genesis 17 colon 1, God appears to Abraham and says, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. Notice something? He doesn't say, I am Yahweh. He says El Shaddai. So who's this El Shaddai, and why did he suddenly disappear from the later parts of the Bible? Spoiler alert, El Shaddai wasn't some alternate name for Yahweh, it's much deeper than that. First off, El is one of the oldest and most revered gods in the ancient Near East, long before Yahweh was a household name. El was worshipped by the Canaanites and other neighboring peoples as the chief god, the father of the gods, the creator of the world. El Shaddai seems to be a variation of El, and while there's some debate about what Shaddai actually means, the most common interpretation is God of the Mountains or God Almighty. But here's where things get interesting, the early Israelites didn't always distinguish between El and Yahweh. In fact, for the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Rel Shaddai was their go-to God. The Israelites didn't emerge out of nowhere. They came from a mix of cultures, surrounded by Canaanites, Amorites, and others who all had their own gods. El was the big deal among these cultures, so it makes perfect sense that when the Bible talks about El Shaddai, it's reflecting an earlier period when Israel's ancestors worshipped this more ancient deity. We're talking about a time before Yahweh became the dominant figure, when the God of Israel's patriarchs was still deeply connected to the wider Canaanite religious world. Now, the Bible itself hints at this shift. In Exodus 6 verse 3, Yahweh tells Moses, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai, but by my name Yahweh I did not make myself known to them. Boom! There it is, right in the text. God admits that he went by a different name to the patriarchs. This isn't just semantics, this is a clear indication that the understanding of God changed over time. The patriarchs didn't know Yahweh as we know him today. They knew El Shaddai. So, what happened to El Shaddai? How did Yahweh take over? Here's where the story gets political. As Israelite religion evolved, especially after the time of Moses and the establishment of a national identity, Yahweh began to rise in prominence. The priesthood and religious leaders worked hard to centralize worship around Yahweh to unify the people. El Shaddai, along with other older gods like Baal and Asherah, had to be phased out to make room for a single, all-powerful deity. But rather than completely discard El Shaddai, they merged him into Yahweh's identity, giving Yahweh the titles and attributes that once belonged to El. Yahweh takes over, but he absorbs all the assets of El, including the name El Shaddai. By the time we get to later books like Deuteronomy and Isaiah, El Shaddai is barely mentioned, and Yahweh has fully stepped into the role of Israel's only God. The old titles get folded into Yahweh's resume, but the story behind them, the story of a much older God worshipped by Israel's ancestors, gets buried under centuries of religious consolidation. Some scholars believe that El Shaddai wasn't just a regional God. He might have been connected to the broader religious current sweeping across the ancient Near East. There are parallels between El Shaddai and Zoroastrianism's Ahura Mazda, the supreme god of light and truth, suggesting that the figure of El Shaddai could represent a much more widespread concept of divinity that transcended national boundaries. In other words, the god of the patriarchs might not have been uniquely Israelite, he could have been part of a shared, ancient vision of a creator god that existed across multiple cultures. Let's get into something you probably didn't learn in Sunday school, Yahweh wasn't always the only God running the show. Nope, there's a little-known concept in the Bible called the Divine Council. And guess what? Yahweh isn't the sole member of it. This council was essentially a group of divine beings, lesser gods if you will, and Yahweh's role in this assembly raises some serious questions about his supposed supremacy. You see, there are multiple passages in the Bible that describe Yahweh standing among other gods, yes, gods, plural, doling out orders and making judgments. Let's start with Psalm 82. This psalm opens with a stunning line, God has taken his place in the divine council, in the midst of the gods he holds judgment. Wait a second, 
Did that just say Yahweh was hanging out with other gods? Yes, it did. And this isn't some obscure verse no one's ever heard of. It's right there in the Psalms, one of the most widely read books of the Bible. Yahweh is described as presiding over a divine assembly of other gods, and his judging them. If Yahweh was always supposed to be the one and only God, who the heck are these other beings? To understand this, we have to look at the ancient Near Eastern context. Israel's neighbors, like the Canaanites, Babylonians, and Sumerians, all had a similar concept of a divine council. The chief god, whether it was El for the Canaanites or Anu for the Sumerians, was surrounded by a host of lesser gods who helped run the universe. The Israelites clearly absorbed this idea and placed Yahweh at the head of their version of the council, but they didn't erase the other gods entirely. At least, not in the earliest texts. The idea of Yahweh as a part of a larger divine council goes back to those ancient traditions where the universe wasn't ruled by a single, omnipotent god but by a pantheon. These divine beings each had their own roles. Some were responsible for specific nations, others for natural forces like rain or fertility. Yahweh, originally, seems to have been one of these gods, a warrior god who eventually rose through the ranks. Here's the juicy part, Deuteronomy 32 verses 8 to 9. In this passage, we get another glimpse of this divine council structure when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob his allotted inheritance. What this is saying is that the Most High, presumably El, divided up the nations and gave each God, or Son of God, a portion of humanity to oversee. Yahweh was assigned Israel. So, in this view, Yahweh wasn't in charge of the entire world, just one specific nation. Other gods were in charge of the rest. Let's stop and think about what this means. Early Israelite religion didn't present Yahweh as the universal God we know from later texts. Instead, he was the patron God of Israel, one of many divine beings assigned to different regions and peoples. Over time, as Israel's identity and religion evolved, Yahweh became more powerful in their narrative. But in the earliest days, he was just one player among many. The whole concept of a divine council suggests that Yahweh wasn't always the supreme God, not at first. Instead, he had to work his way to the top, or more accurately, his followers elevated him to that position as they moved towards monotheism. But the Bible contains these remnants, these clues, that reveal a more complicated story. It's like finding a puzzle piece in the corner of the room that doesn't quite fit with the rest of the picture. There's more. Look at Job 1 verse 6, one day the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan also came with them. Again, we see these sons of God showing up as part of Yahweh's counsel. And here's the kicker, Satan is right there among them, not as Yahweh's enemy, yet, but as one of the divine beings allowed to roam the heavenly court. Satan, in this early story, wasn't the arch nemesis he would become in later Christian theology. He was more like Yahweh's prosecutor, an agent of chaos, sure, but one still under Yahweh's authority, acting within this divine council structure. This divine council setup shows that Yahweh, early on, wasn't as all-powerful or solitary as later interpretations would have us believe. There were other beings, divine beings, who had roles to play. Yahweh's supremacy was a process, something that developed over time as Israelite religion evolved. By the time we get to the book of Isaiah, Yahweh is firmly in control, and any mention of other gods is either eradicated or reframed as idols, but that wasn't the case in the early days. The Bible you know isn't the full story. In fact, there are whole books that were deliberately left out. We're not talking about minor footnotes either, these are full-blown texts that could completely change how you see biblical history. Why were they banned? What were we not supposed to know? First off, we have the Book of Enoch. Now, if you've never heard of this one, it's because it was deliberately excluded from the Bible by religious authorities. Why? Because it's controversial, to say the least. The Book of Enoch dives deep into the story of the Watchers, fallen angels who came to Earth, took human wives, and gave birth to a race of giants known as the Nephilim. This isn't some fringe myth, this is an ancient story that almost made it into the Bible. 
The implications are huge. If the Book of Enoch had been included, it would have changed how we understand not only angels but the entire early history of humanity. Imagine a Bible where angels aren't just messengers from God, but rebellious beings who took part in human history in very physical, even dangerous ways. What's even crazier? The Book of Enoch wasn't just read by a few outliers. It was widely accepted in early Jewish and Christian circles. The New Testament even quotes from it. The letter of Jude refers directly to Enoch's prophesies, so it's not like this book was some forgotten text. It was important, influential, so much so that the powers that be decided to bury it. But the Book of Enoch isn't the only one. Ever heard of the Gospel of Thomas? This is another text that didn't make the cut. Unlike the four Gospels we know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospel of Thomas isn't a narrative of Jesus' life. Instead, it's a collection of sayings attributed to Jesus, and here's the kicker, these sayings paint a very different picture of who Jesus was. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus is much more of a mystic, someone who talks about finding the divine within yourself. He says things like, the kingdom of God is inside you, and it is outside you. That's a far cry from the Jesus of the canonical Gospels, who's more focused on external salvation and the church. It's a spiritual, almost Gnostic view of Christ that doesn't fit neatly into the mainstream Christian narrative. And that's exactly why it was left out. The early church had to decide what kind of image they wanted for Jesus, one that was grounded in an institution with rules, structure, and authority. The Gospel of Thomas didn't support that version of Christianity. It was too individualistic, too focused on personal enlightenment, which didn't help build a unified church. So, it was labeled heretical and tossed aside. Then there's the Apocalypse of Peter. If you think the Book of Revelation is the Bible's only vision of the end times, think again. The Apocalypse of Peter was a serious contender for the New Testament. It's a vivid, terrifying depiction of the afterlife, describing in graphic detail the tortures awaiting sinners. It paints a hell that's much more Dante-esque than what you find in the canonical Bible. This text might have been left out because it was simply too much. The church didn't want people focusing on horrific images of hell, they wanted to control the narrative of salvation and judgment more tightly. Imagine how different the Christian view of the afterlife might be if the apocalypse of Peter had made it in. Fire, brimstone, endless torture, it's all there, but it was too extreme, even for the early church. So, why were these texts, Enoch, Thomas, Peter, and others, banned? The answer is simple, control. The early church was trying to establish itself to define the boundaries of what was acceptable belief and what wasn't. The Bible as we know it today was curated, edited, and shaped to fit a very specific agenda, one God, one path to salvation, one way to understand the divine. Anything that didn't fit neatly into that framework was discarded or buried. Think about it. What does it say about religion when whole books are left out because they don't fit the narrative? It tells us that the Bible isn't this perfect, infallible text handed down from the heavens. It's a collection of writings that were chosen by humans, humans with agendas, biases, and political motivations. The church wanted to create a unified belief system, so they picked the texts that helped them do that, and they suppressed the ones that might lead people to question or challenge their authority. Let's jump right into one of the most twisted dynamics in the Bible, Yahweh versus Satan. Now, if you think this is a simple story of good versus evil, you're missing a huge part of the picture. The truth is, the relationship between Yahweh and Satan is way more complex than you've been told, and at times, it feels like the real adversary isn't who you think it is. In the early parts of the Bible, Satan isn't even portrayed as Yahweh's enemy. That's right. In the book of Job, Satan isn't some fallen angel waging war against God. He's actually part of Yahweh's court, a member of the divine council. And here's the kicker, Satan doesn't act independently, he works with Yahweh to test humanity. Let that sink in. Yahweh gives Satan permission to torment Job, an innocent man, just to prove a point. That's not your typical good guy versus bad guy dynamic, is it? In Job 1 verse 6, it says, one day the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan also came with them. 
Satan is right there, hanging out in the Divine Council. He's not a rebel. He's Yahweh's prosecutor, his job is to challenge humanity, to test people's loyalty to God. So when Satan suggests putting Job through hell, Yahweh is completely on board. In fact, Yahweh authorizes Satan to destroy Job's life, kill his family, and ruin his health, just to see if Job remains faithful. And here's the disturbing part, it's Yahweh who sets the whole thing in motion. Satan might execute the plan, but Yahweh is the one pulling the strings. If we step back for a moment, we have to ask, who's the real adversary here? Satan might get all the blame in popular culture, but Yahweh is the one who allows, even encourages, this suffering to happen. This isn't some rogue Satan figure acting on his own. Yahweh gives the green light, and that changes everything about how we see this relationship. Now, this idea of Satan as a loyal servant to Yahweh, not a rogue enemy, isn't unique to the book of Job. In earlier texts, Satan isn't the devil figure we know today. He's more like an agent of chaos, sure, but he's still working under Yahweh's authority. In fact, the word Satan in Hebrew literally means adversary or accuser, and that's exactly what he does. He's not the ruler of hell, he's Yahweh's legal enforcer, the one who tests and challenges humanity's moral fiber. So, how did Satan go from Yahweh's prosecutor to his mortal enemy? That's where later theology, and especially Christianity, comes in and rewrites the narrative. In the New Testament, particularly in the Gospels, Satan suddenly becomes the great villain, the tempter, the one who opposes God's will. But this wasn't always the case. Early Judaism didn't have a concept of Satan as a fallen angel waging war against God. That came much later, as Christianity needed a clear bad guy to fit into the cosmic battle of good versus evil. They took the role of Satan and ramped it up to serve the narrative. Some scholars argue that Yahweh and Satan weren't always separate entities. In the oldest layers of biblical tradition, what we think of as Satan might actually be part of Yahweh's own personality. Think about it, Yahweh in the Old Testament isn't always this benevolent, loving figure. He's also wrathful, jealous, and vengeful. He destroys entire cities, sends plagues, and tests the very people he claims to love. So, is Satan just an externalization of Yahweh's darker side? Let's take a look at 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1 versus 2 Samuel 24 verse 1. In one passage, it says, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. But in the other, it says, again the anger of Yahweh burned against Israel, and he incited David against them. In one version, Satan is the one who tempts David. In the other, it's Yahweh himself. Which is it? Is it possible that the distinction between Yahweh and Satan wasn't as clear-cut as later theology made it? Could Satan be a stand-in for Yahweh's more destructive tendencies, a way of explaining why God would cause suffering without tarnishing his image as all good? This brings us to the Garden of Eden. Everyone knows the story, Satan, in the form of a serpent, tempts Eve to eat the forbidden fruit, leading to the fall of humanity. But here's something most people don't realize, the serpent is never called Satan in Genesis. That association comes much later. In the original story, the serpent is simply a clever, crafty creature. It's only through later interpretations, especially in the New Testament, that the serpent gets retroactively turned into Satan. But even if we accept that the serpent represents Satan, there's still a question, why would Yahweh, the supposed all-powerful God, allow this to happen? If Yahweh is truly omniscient and omnipotent, then he knew exactly what would happen when he put the tree in the garden and let the serpent slither in. So, is Satan really the bad guy here? Or is Yahweh setting up the entire scenario, knowing full well that it would lead to humanity's fall? It's almost like Yahweh and Satan are playing a cosmic game, where humanity is the pawn. Yahweh sets the stage, allows Satan to tempt, and then punishes humanity for taking the bait. And the book of Job shows us that this isn't a one-off thing. Yahweh continually allows Satan to test, torment, and challenge humanity. It's like there's a built-in adversary to keep humanity on its toes, and that adversary isn't always working against Yahweh, it's working with him. Let's get into one of the most famous stories in the Bible, Noah's Ark and the Great Flood.
Now, here's the thing, this isn't a story that's unique to the Bible. In fact, flood myths are all over the ancient world, and the biblical version might not even be the original. That's right, what if the story of Noah's Ark wasn't an exclusive revelation from Yahweh, but a retelling of much older myths that had already been circulating for centuries? Let's start with the Epic of Gilgamesh, an ancient Mesopotamian text that predates the Bible by about a thousand years. In this epic, we meet a character named Utnapishtim, who is instructed by the gods to build a huge boat to survive a massive flood that's about to wipe out humanity. Sound familiar? The gods send the flood to cleanse the earth of wickedness, Utnapishtim gathers animals two by two, the floodwaters rise, and eventually, he sends out birds to find dry land. It's basically Noah's Ark, but with different names and details. Here's where it gets interesting. The Mesopotamians were telling their flood story long before the Israelites even existed. So, when the biblical writers were compiling Genesis, it's not far-fetched to suggest that they were borrowing from these older traditions. The Sumerians, Babylonians, and Akkadians all had versions of a flood myth. The region was known for its catastrophic floods, and it's likely that these stories were attempts to make sense of the natural disasters that often struck their land. But the biblical twist comes with Yahweh being the one and only God behind it, whereas in the Mesopotamian versions, multiple gods were involved in the decision to flood the earth. Now, some might argue that the similarities between these stories are just a coincidence. But when you break it down, the parallels are way too specific to ignore. The idea of a global flood wiping out humanity, a chosen man building a boat, preserving the world's creatures, it's a pattern that repeats across different cultures. But the biblical version strips away the polytheism of the earlier stories and centers all the power on Yahweh. So, did Yahweh come up with the flood idea on his own, or did the Israelite writers adapt a story that was already ancient by the time it made it into the Bible? Let's take it a step further. The Epic of Atrahasis, another Mesopotamian story, gives us an even clearer picture. In this version, the gods flood the earth because humans are too noisy. Yes, noisy. The gods are annoyed by the constant racket humanity makes, so they decide to wipe them out. Here's where the Bible diverges. In the Noah story, Yahweh floods the earth because of wickedness, a moral failing, not just an annoyance. That's a crucial difference because it shifts the flood from being about the gods' pettiness to being about divine justice. Yahweh isn't just annoyed, he's morally outraged. But the connection to earlier myths doesn't stop there. Take a look at how the flood ends. In both the Gilgamesh and Noah stories, the flood hero sends out birds to find dry land. In Gilgamesh, Utnapishtim sends out a dove, a swallow, and a raven. In Noah's case, it's a raven first, and then a dove. These details are so specific that it's hard to believe they evolved independently. What we're looking at is a shared cultural memory of some massive flooding event or, more likely, a borrowing of motifs that had already been popular in the region for centuries. So, what does this mean for the Bible? It means that the story of Noah's Ark didn't come out of nowhere. It wasn't a wholly original revelation given to the Israelites by Yahweh. Instead, it looks like the biblical writers adapted a much older story, one that had already been told and retold across the ancient world. They took the basic framework, massive flood, chosen hero, animals on a boat, and reworked it to fit their monotheistic worldview. In their version, Yahweh is the sole god behind the flood, and it's about moral accountability rather than the whims of multiple deities. Why would the biblical writers feel the need to include this story at all? If it's borrowed from older myths, what purpose does it serve in their narrative? The answer is theological. By adapting this well-known myth, the Israelite authors were able to make a bold statement, our God is not like your gods. In the Mesopotamian versions, the gods are capricious, acting out of frustration or annoyance. But Yahweh? He acts with purpose. The flood in Genesis isn't about divine irritation, it's about cleansing the earth of evil and starting over with a righteous remnant. The story becomes a moral lesson rather than just a tale of divine wrath.
and here's the genius of it. By taking an already familiar story and adapting it, the biblical writers ensured that their audience, people living in a region where flood myths were already widespread, would immediately recognize the themes, but they'd see Yahweh as the ultimate authority. It was a brilliant move to elevate Yahweh above the gods of neighboring cultures, showing that he alone controls the fate of the world. Here's a part of the Bible that reads more like an ancient sci-fi thriller than anything you'd expect to hear in church, the sons of God and the Nephilim. If you thought Genesis was just about Adam, Eve, and a talking snake, think again. There's a whole other subplot buried in there that almost feels like it was ripped straight out of mythology. The question is, what the heck was going on when the sons of God came down to earth and started messing around with human women? Let's start with Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4, one of the strangest passages in the entire Bible, when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. And just like that, the Bible casually drops this bombshell that divine beings, yes, actual sons of God, decided to take human women as wives, creating offspring that were, well, not exactly normal. These hybrid children became known as the Nephilim, described as mighty men of old, men of renown. What the Bible is describing here is interbreeding between divine beings and humans, a theme that's actually pretty common in ancient mythology. You see it in Greek mythology with the gods coming down to earth, fathering heroes like Hercules. But in the Bible, it feels way out of place. After all, we're taught that Yahweh's story is all about human beings in relationship with a single God, not divine beings coming down to earth, having kids with mortals, and creating giants. So, who were these sons of God? Some scholars argue that they were fallen angels, beings who once had a place in heaven, but rebelled or overstepped their bounds. Others think they might have been a separate class of divine beings, not quite angels, but not quite human either, sort of intermediaries between the heavenly and earthly realms. The term sons of God is used elsewhere in the Bible, like in Job 1 verse 6, where they appear in Yahweh's court, suggesting these beings had a legitimate place in the divine hierarchy. But here's where it gets really bizarre, their offspring, the Nephilim, are often described as giants or mighty warriors, something far beyond ordinary humans. The Bible doesn't give us too many details, but the Book of Enoch, which we talked about earlier, goes all in. It describes the Nephilim as gigantic, monstrous beings who wreaked havoc on the earth. They were violent, destructive, and powerful, and their very existence seems to be part of the reason Yahweh decided to flood the earth. The flood, this catastrophic, world-ending event, might have been caused not just by human wickedness, but by the presence of these hybrid beings, these half-divine, half-human giants running around causing chaos. The Book of Enoch goes so far as to say that the Watchers, a group of fallen angels who descended to Earth, were responsible for teaching humanity forbidden knowledge, like how to make weapons and practice magic. In other words, they didn't just create a race of giants, they also corrupted humanity by giving us dangerous tools we weren't supposed to have. Yahweh's flood, then, wasn't just a punishment for sin, it was a cosmic reset button to wipe out these unnatural creatures and the knowledge they spread. But here's the twist, the Nephilim don't disappear after the flood. In Numbers 13.33, the Israelite spies sent into Canaan report seeing Nephilim in the land. They describe the inhabitants as giants and say, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So, even after Yahweh wiped the slate clean with the flood, remnants of these beings still lingered on earth. What does that mean? Did some of the Nephilim survive, or was there another wave of divine human interaction post-flood? The Nephilim have become one of the Bible's greatest mysteries, sparking theories that range from the plausible to the outlandish. Some scholars think these stories reflect ancient myths that the Israelites inherited from neighboring cultures, like the Canaanites and Babylonians, who had similar tales of gods coming down to mate with mortals. Others see the Nephilim as a remnant of a lost history, one that the biblical writers struggled to fit into their developing monotheistic framework. But why is this part of the Bible so often overlooked? It's probably because it doesn't fit the clean, straightforward narrative of a righteous God and his chosen people. The idea of divine beings breeding with humans, creating superhuman offspring, sounds more like something out of ancient mythology than a sacred text.
and maybe that's why these stories are so compelling. They offer a glimpse into a time when the lines between the divine and the human were far blurrier than we're comfortable with today. Let's talk about something that tends to get brushed under the rug, Yahweh's role as a war god. That's right, if you actually read the Old Testament, Yahweh isn't just a god of love and mercy. In fact, some of his most defining moments are when he's commanding, orchestrating, and even personally carrying out acts of extreme violence. We're not talking about metaphorical battles here, we're talking full-scale, blood-soaked warfare. So, how did the God of the Israelites become one of the most ruthless military commanders in the ancient world? First, let's address the elephant in the room, the conquest of Canaan. If you've ever read the book of Joshua, you know what I'm talking about. When the Israelites are finally allowed to enter the promised land, Yahweh doesn't tell them to move in peacefully. No, he orders them to wipe out the inhabitants of Canaan, down to the last man, woman, and child. But it doesn't stop there. Let's talk about Jericho, the city whose walls famously came tumbling down. The Israelites, following Yahweh's orders, march around the city for seven days. On the seventh day, after the walls collapse, they go in and slaughter everyone. We're talking men, women, children, animals, no one is spared. This is Yahweh's war, and the brutality is total. Now, if this sounds shocking, it's because it should. These stories paint a picture of Yahweh that's far removed from the image of a benevolent, all-loving God. In these moments, Yahweh is a war God, a deity whose power is demonstrated not through peace, but through the absolute destruction of his enemies. Here's the kicker, Yahweh's warlike nature wasn't unique in the ancient world. Other gods from neighboring cultures, like the Canaanite god Baal or the Babylonian god Marduk, were also seen as warrior deities, leading their people into battle and ensuring their victory. What makes Yahweh different is that, over time, the Israelites tried to transition him from a regional war god into the universal creator of everything. But the early stories in the Bible haven't fully shaken off Yahweh's war god roots, and they're still filled with bloody campaigns, conquest and slaughter. Take 1 Samuel 15 verse 3, for example. Yahweh commands King Saul to go to war against the Amalekites and says, Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. It's absolute. It's merciless. Yahweh isn't looking for a moral victory, he's ordering total annihilation. And when Saul spares the king of the Amalekites and some of the livestock, Yahweh punishes him for not being brutal enough. That's the kind of war god we're talking about here, one who demands total obedience and total destruction. So, where does this warlike identity come from? Some scholars argue that the Israelites, living in a region surrounded by hostile enemies, needed a god who could protect them, who could lead them in battle. Yahweh was originally a god of the wilderness, a god of warriors, so when the Israelites fought against the Canaanites, the Philistines, and the Moabites, Yahweh became their ultimate warlord. And in a world where survival often depended on military might, a peaceful god just wouldn't cut it. Yahweh doesn't just lead battles, he actively participates in them. In Exodus 15 verse 3, after the Israelites escape from Egypt, they sing, The Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. In this context, Yahweh is celebrated as the one who drowned Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. He's not just sitting in the background, he's right there, in the thick of it, wiping out Egypt's military forces to ensure his people's survival. Another brutal example? 2 Kings 19 verse 35, where Yahweh sends an angel to slaughter 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. That's not an act of self-defense or negotiation. That's a full-scale massacre, ordered by Yahweh to protect Jerusalem. And there's no sugarcoating it, this is a divine hit job, executed with ruthless efficiency. Now, some might argue that Yahweh's violent nature is confined to the Old Testament, and that the New Testament presents a different side of him, a God of love and mercy. But here's the thing, you can't just separate the two. The Bible itself presents Yahweh as a God of consistency, meaning his character doesn't change between the Old and New Testaments. The violent, or waging Yahweh of the Old Testament is the same God that Jesus refers to as Father in the New Testament. So, how do we reconcile that? 
Well, maybe we don't. Maybe part of understanding Yahweh is accepting that he's a deeply complex deity. The Israelites didn't view Yahweh's violence as a problem, they saw it as proof of his power. In a brutal, war-torn world, they needed a God who could crush their enemies, who could lead them to victory. And for them, Yahweh's willingness to destroy was a sign of his devotion to his people. What if Jesus wasn't just the Son of God, but a radical reformer who came to challenge the very essence of Yahweh? I know, it sounds wild, but stick with me because the relationship between Jesus and Yahweh might not be as harmonious as traditional theology wants us to believe. First off, let's talk about the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus famously tells people to turn the other cheek, to love your enemies, and to pray for those who persecute you. Hold on a minute, this is the same God who, in the Old Testament, wiped out entire nations, ordered mass slaughters, and even took vengeance on his own people when they disobeyed. So how do we square these two very different approaches to justice? Let's put it this way, Jesus didn't just tweak Yahweh's rules, he turned them upside down. When Jesus says things like, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person, he's directly challenging one of the core laws of Yahweh, the famous, eye for an eye justice system laid out in the Torah. This was Yahweh's idea of fairness, if someone wrongs you, wrong them back equally. Yet here's Jesus coming in and saying, nope, that's not how we're going to do things anymore. And it's not just about forgiveness. Jesus also emphasizes compassion, mercy, and love as the highest virtues. But when we look at Yahweh's track record, that's not exactly his MO, is it? Remember Yahweh in the Old Testament ordering Saul to wipe out every Amalekite, or Yahweh raining fire on Sodom and Gomorrah? Yahweh's version of justice often involves punishment and destruction. Meanwhile, Jesus shows a radically different path, he's healing the sick, dining with sinners, and offering salvation to everyone, even the outcasts and criminals. Here's where it gets really interesting. Jesus frequently refers to God as Father, and while this seems like a continuation of Old Testament theology, there's a subtle difference. Jesus is presenting God as a loving, forgiving, and personal figure, much softer and more intimate than the fierce Yahweh of old. When Jesus says, I and the Father are one, is he talking about Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament? Or is Jesus introducing a new concept of divinity, one that contrasts with the wrathful deity of Israel's history? Take, for example, Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees and religious leaders of the day. In John 8, Jesus accuses them of being blind to God's true will, even though they were the keepers of the law of Moses, Yahweh's own laws. Jesus tells them that they don't know the Father, implying that their strict adherence to Yahweh's laws has actually distanced them from the true essence of God. It's almost like Jesus is saying, you've misunderstood what God is really about. You've been too focused on the letter of the law, and you've missed the spirit. Some scholars go even further and suggest that Jesus was, in fact, standing in opposition to Yahweh, or at least to the traditional interpretation of Yahweh's laws. The Gnostics, for example, believed that the God of the Old Testament, whom they called the Demiage, was a flawed, lower being, while Jesus represented a higher, true God of light and love. In this view, Yahweh wasn't even the real, supreme God. He was a kind of cosmic tyrant, and Jesus came to free humanity from his oppressive rule. Now, mainstream Christianity rejected this idea, but the tension between the Old and New Testaments remains, even in the orthodox versions of the Bible. Consider also how Jesus deals with judgment. Yahweh's version of judgment in the Old Testament is swift and brutal. Sin leads to immediate consequences, plagues, wars, exile. Yet Jesus spends his ministry offering grace. He doesn't come down like Yahweh with fire and brimstone, instead, he offers a path to redemption. Even on the cross, Jesus doesn't call down divine wrath on his enemies, instead, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Could you imagine Yahweh saying that? This isn't just a new chapter in the divine story, it feels like an entirely new book. So what's going on here? Was Jesus subtly, or maybe even not so subtly, challenging the harshness of the God of the Old Testament? Was he offering a new vision of divinity, one based on love, forgiveness, and inclusion, instead of judgment and punishment? <laughs>
Or was he simply trying to correct humanity's misunderstanding of Yahweh, showing that the God they had been following all along was meant to be loving and forgiving, but they'd lost sight of that through centuries of legalism and violence? One thing's for sure, the Jesus we see in the Gospels is not just a continuation of Yahweh's character. He's presenting something fresh, something radical, and it almost feels like a break from the past. Whether that's because he's revealing a new side of Yahweh, or because he's presenting a God who's altogether different, is still up for debate. But one thing is clear, the tension between Old Testament Yahweh and New Testament Jesus is real, and it forces us to ask some hard questions about who God really is and what his relationship to humanity is supposed to be. Let's wrap this up with the biggest question of all, is the God described in the Bible the true creator of the universe? Now, this might sound straightforward to anyone raised in a Judeo-Christian tradition, but the deeper you dive into ancient texts, myths, and alternative interpretations, the more complicated it gets. What if Yahweh wasn't the only player on the divine stage? What if the creation story we've been told is just one version of a much larger, more complex narrative? First, let's talk about Genesis 1. We've been conditioned to think of Yahweh as the one and only God from the very beginning, the creator of everything. But as we've seen, the Bible itself isn't as consistent about this as you might think. There are those subtle hints about other gods, plural, especially when Genesis refers to God as Elohim, a word that, if we're being honest, has a plural form. And this doesn't even touch on the ancient Mesopotamian, Egyptian, or Sumerian creation myths that predate the Bible and tell their own version of how the universe began. Let's talk about Sumerian mythology, for example. Long before the Bible, the Sumerians believed that the world was created by Enki, a god of wisdom and water, and his half-sister Ninhursag. Then you've got Marduk, the Babylonian god who creates order out of chaos by slaying the chaos monster Tiamat. In Egyptian mythology, creation starts with the god Partar, who speaks the world into existence. So the idea of a god, or gods, creating the universe wasn't unique to the Israelites. In fact, creation myths are as old as civilization itself. Yahweh's role as creator is just one interpretation, but it borrows heavily from the myths of surrounding cultures. Let's not forget about the Gnostics either, who had a radically different take. They believed that the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, wasn't the true creator at all. According to them, the Demiurge, a flawed, lower God, created the material world. The true God, the one beyond all comprehension, was distant, and it was through Jesus that humanity could reconnect with this higher, unknowable divine source. In their view, Yahweh was a cosmic pretender, ruling over a broken, imperfect world, while the real creator was far removed from the chaos we live in. This wasn't a fringe belief either, it was widespread enough that early Christian leaders had to actively suppress it to maintain their version of the truth. So, where does this leave us? Was Yahweh the original creator, or was he just one of many gods who claimed that title in the ancient world? Even in the Bible itself, we find evidence of other divine beings involved in creation or the running of the cosmos. Psalm 82 talks about Yahweh presiding over a divine council, judging other gods, if Yahweh was truly the one and only God, why does this council even exist? Why does the Bible refer to these other beings as sons of God and not simply dismiss them as false idols? Then there's the book of Job, where Yahweh speaks of creating the world, but again, it feels more like he's talking to an audience of divine beings, beings who were around before the world was made. Is Yahweh talking to himself, or is this another nod to a more complicated divine order that we've lost track of over the centuries? The truth is, when you start digging into the ancient texts, the Bible's God seems less like a solitary, all-powerful figure and more like a deity who rose to prominence, possibly even at the expense of other gods. So, is Yahweh the true creator? That depends on how you define a true. If you're looking for the original God of creation, you'll find a lot of competition. From Enki to Marduk to Partar, ancient civilizations all had their own creator gods long before the Israelites claimed Yahweh as theirs. And when you factor in alternative interpretations like the Gnostic view, the idea of Yahweh as the one true God becomes even more complex. What's undeniable, though, is that Yahweh became the creator for millions, if not billions, of people around the world. His story, as told in the Bible, 
has shaped entire civilizations and continues to influence how we think about the universe, morality, and our place within it. But whether he was truly the original creator or just one voice among many, that's a question that may never have a simple answer. And that's it, folks. Whether Yahweh is the true creator or part of a larger divine legacy, the story is much more nuanced than we've been led to believe. Thanks for sticking with us through this journey and we hope it's given you a fresh perspective on the God of the Bible. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. Your support means the world and we love hearing your thoughts on these deep, complex issues. Thank you so much for watching. God bless us all.